Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Karen Andres, the Director of Policy and Market Solutions at the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program, and I'll serve as the moderator of today's discussion on debt, um, both what we can do now in the immediate um, crisis and also afterward to help American families come out of this without being dragged down um, by the various forms of debt that they're managing. Um, in general, I'd say we think this is a really um, an important moment to make sure that debt is not the lasting legacy of COVID-19. Um, and I am excited about the, the group of leaders we have assembled here today. Um, here at Aspen FSP, we've been working on various um, solutions to different kinds of debt for several years. And our work on debt has been made possible with the support of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the MetLife Foundation, the Prudential Foundation, and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Um, so thank you so much to all of our partners. Uh, so we're bringing together a really thoughtful group of leaders from diverse sectors, um, from research, from um, for-profit startups, uh, uh, from elected, elected officials, uh, to get their perspectives on what we can do to keep families, from, um, to keep families afloat during the crisis. Um, so right now, I want to go ahead and do some, some quick introductions in absentia. They'll be joining us in a minute. Uh, but you can find longer bios on the event page of our website. So first, I will be joined by Mayor Melvin Carter, who has served as the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota since 2018. He is committed to equity and financial security. And this week, it was announced that St. Paul has been awarded $50,000 from cities and counties for fine and fee justice to pursue bold and innovative solutions to municipal and court fines and fees. Uh, we should note that Mayor Carter is also an Aspen Rodell Fellow, um, and we're big fans of that fellowship and the leaders it convenes, um, and we're very grateful to have the mayor with us today. So after I speak one-on-one -on -one with the mayor, I will invite Laura Berland and Jerry Namoran to join the conversation. Laura is the founding executive director of the Sycamore Institute, a Tennessee-based nonpartisan public policy research center. We've gotten to work closely with Laura, largely on medical debt, through our work with the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Southern Partnership to Reduce Debt. Um, so we know Laura and are very um, impressed with her work and excited to have her join us as well. And finally, Jerry Namoran is the CEO and founder of Lend Street, which is a debt restructuring financial health platform. Uh, Jerry uh, very kindly served on our Consumer Debt Advisory Board for the multi-year epic cycle we did on consumer debt. Um, and we're always looking for opportunities to pick his brain. So um, before I invite our panelists to join us, I do want to situate us a little bit. Uh, debt is a big and complex topic with lots of dimensions and drivers. Um, so let's just look quickly at where things stood pre-COVID, right before the world exploded. Um, so we pulled a couple of, of graphs from the Wall Street Journal that draw on data from, um, I believe this one's from the New York Fed. Um, so this shows uh, that mortgage debt um, you know, has historically, especially if you look at the peak, um, 2008, right before the financial crisis, uh, mortgage debt has made up a significant chunk of, uh, of debt in America and currently does make up a significant chunk of the $14 trillion in outstanding um, consumer debt. But I think what's important is that the composition of debt has changed a lot since the early 2000s. Uh, mortgage debt peaked as a share of debt in 2008, and over the next decade, as mortgage debt fell, other forms of non-housing debt rose really fast. Um, so since 2017, non-housing debt has comprised the majority of household debt in America. Uh, so let's look at the composition of non-mortgage debt. Um, you can kind of see uh, that we're looking at a combination. The big chunks are student loan debt, credit card debt, auto loan debt has really surged. Um, I think what's not reflected here um, is sort of, if this is a secured and unsecured non-mortgage debt, uh, what's not reflected here are, is the debt that results from unpaid bills. According to Experian, 77 million Americans have debt in collections, and that debt is a combination of this secured and unsecured um, lending, as well as unpaid bills. So medical bills, utility bills, unpaid municipal or court fines and fees, even unpaid gym memberships and cell phone bills. Um, so th these debts are not reflected in this chart, uh, but nonetheless put real stress on households and have real consequences, um, including service shutoffs, bankruptcy declaration, and even loss of liberty in some jurisdictions. So I think it's important we look at that full picture um, of secured and unsecured lending, as well as the unpaid bills. Um, that's the total picture that Americans were struggling with. 
Um, so now I'd like to invite um, St. Paul, Minnesota Mayor Melvin Carter to unmute himself and turn on his video. And while he's doing that, let me give a little technology overview. So you're all muted, of course, um, but you can submit questions throughout the hour. Um, so we're, I believe, through the Q&A function. So we are holding time at the end. We'll be combing through some of your questions um, and we'll ask a few of them to our experts. So um, Mayor Carter, you're good with the tech. Uh, I, I think so. Got it, got it working. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and before we get started, um, I really want to acknowledge that um, we know we've been following the news the past couple of days, and this is a really challenging time for you and the Twin Cities community, given the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis on Monday. And so we really appreciate um, the time that you're taking to be with us, uh, to discuss this issue with us when you've got, um, there's a lot of pain in your community right now. So thank you so much. Thank you. There's a, there is an enormous amount of pain and anger around this, uh, around that killing. That's been something that has uh, uh, taken center stage here in the Twin Cities over the last uh, uh, 24 hours or so. Uh, and there's an enormous amount of work to get done, to do on that. And uh, as we discussed a little bit earlier, I think that those two are, uh, you know, what we're talking about that and what we're talking about now is uh, pretty closely related. Well, let me just jump right in then. I know that racial equity has been a big focus for you. Um, and your administration um, since you became the mayor in 2018. And um, you took action pretty fast um, on issues of financial security. Can you, can you tell us what you've done in the city of St. Paul around these issues of financial security for your residents? Yeah, absolutely, Laura. And first, I, I like to share with folks that whatever your preconceived notions about St. Paul are, they're probably 100% true like 40 years ago. Uh, right now, St. Paul is a fast growing city uh, we just uh, reached our all-time high peak population. Uh, we're a city that's a majority people of color now. Uh, we have people who come to St. Paul uh, from East Africa, Southeast Asia, all over the world, and certainly all over the country. Uh, and, and we have in our public schools here, uh, we have children in our public schools who speak over, four, over 100 different languages at home. So we're this diverse community. Uh, being focused on racial equity really is not an option for us. Because if we want our city uh, to, to succeed uh, in a community that is majority people of color, then that is uh, simultaneous, that is, that is synonymous uh, rather uh, with ensuring that our children of color, our businesses owned by people of color, our families of color uh, can find success in St. Paul. So uh, I got elected in 2017, came into office in 2019. One of our core focuses uh, was on raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Got that done in, in year one. Uh, created an office of financial empowerment uh, to help just, you know, our kind of broad mission statement in my mind for that is to help a broader set of St. Paul residents and businesses uh, make money work for them, uh, who oftentimes, who too often feel like money is working against them. Uh, we've created a, a college, uh, an initiative called College Bound St. Paul, and I'm happy to talk uh, in more specific details about any of these things that you're interested in. Uh, we created a College Bound St. Paul, which is a college savings accounts program to designed to start every child born in our city with $50 uh, in a college savings account. Uh, and we also eliminated lot of, uh, fines, uh, late fines in our public libraries uh, to ensure that every family in our city can afford to use the library. So we have been trying to be aggressive uh, and it's been something that, uh, you know, of course, has gotten mixed reviews uh, from different folks. Either someone uh, absolutely gets it right off and loves what we're doing or feels incredibly threatened, strangely, by it. So say more about, um, that was, that was pre-COVID, right? So you came in, yes. like, the incident before the world exploded, you had been undertaking a pretty, pretty um, sort of significant program of reform all around the financial security of your residents in different ways. Um, when, talk a little bit about what you saw happening in St. Paul once this crisis really started to bloom. and, and and where did you look first in terms of protecting the financial well-being of your mm -hmm. residents? Well, I'll tell you, what's happening in St. Paul isn't all that dissimilar from what's happening around the country. We've seen, obviously, as this pandemic goes forward, uh, there's a, a very strong theme about racial equity, as we've seen nationwide, uh, partic in particular, uh, black and brown communities uh, coming up with disparities at every level of the public health crisis. My grandmother, uh, I guess almost every African-American grandmother used to say that when America catches a cold, black America catches the flu, 
uh, and our current experience is totally proving that. We're seeing disparities in number of cases, we're seeing disparities in number of deaths, we're seeing disparities in numbers of, of, of cases that require hospitalization. Uh, I'll say in Minnesota, we're fortunate to have a governor uh, who took strong action early uh, to protect Minnesotans. So uh, we haven't seen, you know, it, it took a while for us to start seeing those kind of disparities with regard to the cases, but right away we saw the disparities with regard to economics. 40% uh, of low-income families uh, lost their job in March or April of this year. Uh, and when we when we look at who's filing for unemployment insurance, uh, who's losing their homes as we see our, our unsheltered population of people experiencing homelessness uh, peak, uh, right now, you know, those things are, are, are creating a crisis, an economic, acute economic crisis in St. Paul and around the globe. Uh, like I said, we had the experience of uh, trying to be aggressive on uh, helping people secure their financial security uh, over the past couple of years. We've had the experience in particular with moving towards fine free, fine free libraries and the conversation, not only the debate around that, but the outcomes around that, which instantly, literally in year one, we saw double digit increases uh, in library use in our lowest income, most diverse communities. So we know that when we change the policies, uh, the outcomes can change uh, pretty fast around that. And so uh, that's informed a host of measures that were taken uh, in our COVID environment, uh, which started with uh, delaying our assessments and uh, completely halting uh, any collections that were going on on bills that people owed to the city. Uh, that included uh, creating uh, discounts for business licenses of, that are impacted by the governor's uh, shutdown or stay at home orders. Uh, and that also included uh, uh, stopping any like auto sales, auto auctions, uh, towing fees, those types of things that we levy on folks. Uh, we actually completely waived, um, you know, I see, I saw the, the auto loan components of the non-housing debt on the graph that you showed. Uh, we actually waived uh, all towing and impound fees, uh, had about 600 cars in, in impound here in St. Paul, and just invited people, just come get your car. We know everybody needs access to anything that they can use to uh, make a living or get ahead right now, uh, and we wanted to make sure that people knew that the city's in it with you. I'm so glad you went there on the auto loan piece, as you and I talked mm -hmm. about been wondering a lot about that in non-urban in non -urban and suburban areas in particular. You know, got to have a car, right? Um, yes. If people to earn money after this or even during this. We're working um, on that, but yes, for now, you still have to have a car. Got it. Right, I know. <laughs> Let me know when public transit is available outside of urban areas. I'm waiting for it. Um, right. So what's, you know, you've obviously taken a lot of care about thinking, thinking through all the ways that, you know, debt can echo through someone's life and prevent employment and earned income, right? Um, what has feedback been like from residents? What's, you, you said at the beginning, Pre-COVID, you were getting, you know, a little bit of a mixed response. Some people felt threatened. What's been the response to some of the some of these really proactive actions you've taken during this crisis? You know, we're really fortunate that we had that we've we've started the conversation pre-COVID. Like I said, around fine free libraries in particular, I don't know why it made some people so angry, uh, but you know, people, it's just not the way the libraries are run. But when you think about it, like, and and to be clear about our policy, if you break a book or burn a book or never bring a book back or destroy it or otherwise, uh, you still owe us you know, what it costs to replace the book. But if you bring back a book on Thursday instead of Wednesday, you can keep your dollar and 79 cents. Uh, one of the things that uh, has always struck me about that policy is uh, that absolute worst case failure of, of that policy uh, would be more kids having more books at home. And that would in and of itself would also be something that I could live with. Like I said, we not only have seen double digit increases in library use in our lowest income communities, we've actually seen our return rates go up. We haven't seen uh, waiting periods go, you know, uh, intriguingly, books are a little bit more likely to be a couple days late, uh, but significantly less likely to be a couple of weeks late. So our community has really taken us up on the promise. Our libraries are thriving, they're growing, people are using our libraries uh, in a way that they never have before. Uh, right now, uh, it creates the fact that we all know that we're in this economic crisis, I think has created some space for us to be creative. It's created some space for us to take care of each other in ways that we normally wouldn't. Uh, one of the first things that we did as a city was create uh, the St. Paul Bridge Fund. We re, kind of re, re, restructured uh, about $3 million, just a little over $3 million to just create emergency grants for families and small businesses 
one of the things that we heard really early is, you know, for our most vulnerable, lowest income families, for our most vulnerable, smallest businesses, uh, uh, even a, a low interest uh, or even a forgivable loan uh, was a debt instrument that was completely useless to them. They're not in a position to take on a, a loan, or even say the word loan. And so we structured those as grants uh, to provide help to people right in need right then. Uh, one of the things that will forever touch my heart is the fact that we sent out a, a call for help uh, and literally within two weeks, uh, our private sector, our philanthropic sector, and our residents worked together uh, to provide about uh, three quarters of a million dollars of just contributions to help boost that fund so we could help uh, significantly more families and businesses. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we got that into the field early. Uh, and I'll tell you, the, the, the response uh, has really been strong. Uh, the response has been overwhelmingly positive as our residents know that these types of measures are absolutely needed. Well, I think, you know, I, as we've seen those sorts of models roll out over the country, it's hard not to look at that and say that's that sort of unrestricted cash is going to keep people out of debt when this is over, right? Um, it will keep them fed now, um, but in the absence, what, what would people be doing in the absence of that money, right? When, when people have their necessities have to be paid for. So I really applaud that, that fast action and leadership by the, by the Twin Cities community. Laura, you know. that's, that's certainly the hope. I'll tell you, what, one of the things that haunts me, uh, the biggest negative feedback that we've gotten about the bridge fund and the business licenses and some of those things uh, that we're doing is that it's not enough, is that we need more. And I absolutely agree with those things. We're making available what we can. Cities like us who have less than 500,000 people in our population, we're at 315,000, so we're large enough to have a significant set of challenges uh, that cost a significant amount of money. Uh, th uh, that we have to deal with right now. We're not large enough to have any federal appropriations whatsoever so far to help with our, the, the stresses this creates on our general fund strategy. Uh, and as we look in Washington, D.C. and see some of the folks uh, who lead bodies and or decision makers in Washington, D.C. say there's absolutely no rush to provide additional assistance to our communities, to our cities, uh, to residents, and to businesses. Uh, it's a real insult, uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make do what we can with what we have right now. So I guess as we look forward, um, you know, we're we're seeing a variety of leaders like you take action in different ways to to support families through this. Um, mm -hmm. What do you hope takes hold? What do you hope, whether in St. Paul or other communities, what should stay permanent? What should be a feature of financial life in America um, coming out of this crisis? You know, it's such an important question. You know, I've I've actually stopped using the word recovery. Uh, because you know I, I, I run a lot and when I run after I run I want to recover and that means trying to get back to where I was before I started running if our goal is to recover if our goal is to get back to where we were in January then we'll just be setting ourselves up to be just as vulnerable as we were now what we're seeing right now is some significant vulnerabilities and some significant shortcomings in the way that our economy is set up we're finding out that when people don't have access to safe, stable housing, that when people can't go to the doctor when they feel like they have some symptoms, when people can't take a week off of work or two weeks off of work to recover from an illness or care for their child, our whole economy, our whole system, our whole country uh, is vulnerable. And so a lot of the things that we're doing now as emergency measures and seeing as these extraordinary emergency measures, uh, I think do need to be continued, uh, do need to just be start moving towards being the way of life. We're creating, for example, a more open space for people to walk or walk, ride a bike or, or, or jog safely within keeping with uh, social distance requirements. Some of those things I think needs to be permanent. One of the things that we definitely have our eyes on, have, have had our eyes on for a while through Office of Financial Empowerment uh, is those impound lot fees that I was mentioning to you. You know, we have home, we have cars, they get towed uh, and for lack of, you know, $300, $400 to pick up a car that's in impound, uh, our lowest income residents uh, lose their vehicles. That's not just in St. Paul, but that's cities across the country. We know that our higher income families, we know that our, you know, they're not, you know, new Mercedes Benzes uh, that are being uh, auctioned off, uh, but we're seeing folks lose their vehicles. And as you pointed out earlier, a vehicle is still a critical part of a family's ability to make a living. So that's one of the things that we're targeting. Uh, as you mentioned, you mentioned that I'm a Rodell Fellow. I'm also a former Aspen Ascend Fellow, which was an incredible program uh, that I had a, was fortunate to go through as well. Uh, but uh, you know, you mentioned uh, our inclusion in the Fines and Fees Justice Cohort. We're excited to participate in that. Looking forward to identify more and more things that we can make permanent through that core experience.
Well, Mayor, I'm just so grateful for your leadership and the things that you're doing in St. Paul to take care of your residents. Um, uh, so I'm now, I'd like to invite uh, Laura Berland and Jerry Namorin um, to unmute and turn video on to join the conversation. Hi, Laura. And it looks like there's Jerry. Um, so delighted to have now all of us together um, to sort of sort of zoom out on what the mayor was saying, right? I mean, he's saying, right? I mean, he's, he saw what was happening in his municipality, in his city, uh, pre-COVID, um, and it wasn't good, and took action to prevent things from getting worse um, and to support residents. And I guess, uh, like, first to you, Laura, um, from where you sit as the, the executive director of the Sycamore Institute in Tennessee, I guess I'd love to know from you, what were you working on, you know, like February 28th? <laughs> yes. What were you focused on and where are you focused now? What are you, what are you most worried about right now when it comes to household debt in America? Sure. So um, Sycamore's medical debt research that we did largely last year was a part of a larger body of work uh, that we were doing on financial security and economic uh, mobility in that Annie Casey cohort uh, with you all at Aspen. Um, and I'd say pre-COVID, we were planning to continue tracking our medical debt work. Our research team laid out 12 policy options that appealed to a wide range of political perspectives on things that could be done to better prevent, better manage, or mitigate the negative effects of, of medical debt. Um, but the bulk of our attention was actually going to move on to the next bucket of debt in fees and fines, which you've already talked about a little bit, um, both how they impact debtors as well as the systems and institutions that, that levy them. But um, we're still going to do this work. Um, what we decided, you know, February 28th and then the weeks that followed was that coronavirus is really asking us to stare down both a health crisis and an economic crisis. Um, and medical debt really lives at the intersection of those two issues, or those two buckets. So our commitment as a nonpartisan source of relevant, actionable, timely information means that we really needed to downshift and dig deeper into the medical debt work that we were doing. Um, so we're watching how providers and payers and patients are navigating the medical costs associated with testing and treatment for COVID-19. Um, we're also looking at how our state and local government's uh, capacity to respond to the needs of people that they serve. So with revenue shortfalls and increasing needs, you know, how are those various entities and levels of government and institutions going to, to deal with the crisis? I feel like I want to ask you for your sense of the punchline, but I'll wait. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll ask you the same question. So, um, Len Street offers an affordable consumer centric debt consolidation product um, that's really built around the cash flow needs of your customers, um, which means that you have a pretty good sense of where people are in their lives. Um, what do you, what were, where were you focused in late February from a business perspective? What problems were you working on and how has that shifted? Yeah. Um... Thanks, Karen, and thanks for, for having me. <clears throat> so prior to COVID, um, we were primarily focused on helping consumers who were distressed uh, to restructure their debt and re-engage the system quicker. Uh, as COVID has made abundantly clear, the vast majority of Americans are financially fragile, um, and this can lead to a uh, long recovery, uh, both from the credit side as well as on the financial side. Um, and you know, what we believe is that people <clears throat> deserve a second chance. And, and we do that by providing them with a loan that pays off their old debt uh, at terms that reflect their current reality. Um, and so, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, prior to COVID, there is about uh, 77 million Americans, one out of every three American um, had a delinquent debt uh, totaling roughly $652 billion. Um, and, and this comes at a peak of, of $14.3 trillion in household debt, as you also highlighted earlier in your presentation. Um, now we have 38.6 million Americans who have filed for unemployment in nine weeks. Nine weeks, right? So we are seeing a shift, um, at least from our end, in terms of consumers who are seeking relief. Um, we're seeing a higher income segment of the population. Um, we're seeing higher debt load. Uh, and, and we believe, you know, this is the time now for all stakeholders, creditors, and, and, and you know, other parties like ourselves to come together and really create 
um, the right tools to allow folks to uh, navigate through the cycle and, and, re and emerge from it stronger and with a stronger balance sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna follow, follow up on that and I'm gonna go back to Laura, because you teased a punchline. What are the right tools, Jerry? I see, we see what the mayor's doing, right? At a municipal level, who else needs to do what, do you think? What's on the table? Oh, are you asking me or Laura? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. asking you first and then I'll go to Laura. Um, you know, I think what we've learned uh, through our, through our, you know, six years, seven years of lending is that consumers really are seeking when they're in, in times of financial distress, really they're seeking help. Um, you know, they're willing to pay off their debt um, and they're willing to, 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 to find the solution, you know, to, to, to engage and execute on, on the right path. Uh, so I think more, more than ever, it's, it's uh, incumbent upon us to start thinking of ways that allows consumers to, to meet the consumer where they are, most, first and foremost. Right? Collections have never worked, or I shouldn't say have never worked, has had low recovery rates, and, and we can't continue to use the same collection tools. Um, we need to start thinking about holistic solutions that you know, that inf affect all stakeholders, right? So you, know, you have the creditors, you have the consumers, uh, and, and it has to be one that is focused on the financial health of the consumer. So by meeting the consumer where they are, it means, to your point earlier, you know, understanding their capacity and creating solutions that are based around that consumer's capacity. And that's been our focus at, at Lynn Street and, and, and our results have shown that if you do that and when you do that, you have a significantly higher rate of success. Um, you know, we're, we're helping creditors recover about 48% of the, of, the, of the delinquent debt that consumers owed. Um, and we're, you know, we have uh, our average consumer has a credit score where they, they are out, outperforming their cohorts that are 100 points higher than them, right? So if we're thinking about solutions that are meeting the consumer where they are, then I think, we'll, you know, it's the same with the mayor, right? If we're providing the right tools, the right solutions that meet the consumer where they are, we believe that those are the right solutions in this, especially in this in this time. And and Laura, I mean, I'm, maybe it's too early, but do you have a sense of whether whether the the medical that the healthcare system will be able to meet people where they are in the midst of this crisis, financially speaking? You know, it's a it's a very, very complicated problem that has, you know, re requires a wide array of responses. I mean, the the medical, the entire healthcare system, I think, in this country is, uh, you know, a tangled, complicated problem. But the way we looked at uh, addressing medical debt was really to put it in three buckets. Um, and so think about one bucket being the prevention bucket. Let's stop unpaid medical bills from becoming debt at all. They don't go to the courtroom. Uh, patients don't get sued. We potentially don't have surprise billing um, or we look at expanded health coverage so that, that folks have insurance to cover their medical costs. Um, you can also look at a bucket of management, right? How do we better manage debt once we've already got it? Um, and, and that can be looking at building programs to help individuals build rainy day funds. It could, you know, all the financial empowerment work that, that cities are, a lot of cities are doing really well, um, is super helpful in that managing debt better bucket. And then there's the mitigation side, right? All the way down, kind of downstream, as we tend to think about policy intervention being upstream or downstream. And there's a whole bucket of services that we can look at there, which are largely what Jerry and, and Mayor Carter have been talking about. Um, so, you know, one of the exciting uh, projects that we've gotten involved with was the online dispute resolution uh, pilot, which we can talk about now, or if you want to wait for that down down the... No, I, I mean, debt is big and thorny and complicated, and Jerry started to go down the path of, you know, of collections, basically. Um, and we've spent a little bit of time digging into the debt collections litigation and the way that that usually results in a somewhere between a 70 to 90 percent rate of default judgment against the borrower, um, which means that the borrower never even engaged in the process um, and judges sort of move it along quickly in favor of the, the creditor um, or the, the third party debt buyer um, bringing the suit. And so, yeah, Laura, I would love to hear. I, so if we just take as a given that that process is 
not balanced in terms of power distribution and therefore probably leading to unfair outcomes in a significant number of cases. Laura, what have you been working on? Give us hope. Yeah, um, so we were really excited that the research that we did was one of the driving forces to get a pilot launched in uh, Hamilton County in Tennessee where they are going to partner with the local hospital system there and with the administrative office of the uh, office of the courts to pilot an online dispute resolution basically keeping those unpaid bills uh, out of the courtrooms and there were a lot of uh, motivating factors so the judge the general sessions court judge there was seeing his courtroom overwhelmed just filled with cases related to debt uh, that just didn't need to be there. And so they were clogging up the court system and taking up resources there. Um, the hospitals you know, were not getting paid for their bills. And of course that puts pressure on the, the, the hospital system there. And then of course the individual families were getting overwhelmed with bills that they couldn't pay. And so the idea here, it hasn't gotten up and running yet, but it, it's getting ready to be, um, is, is that they'll try getting these disputes resolved outside uh, the, the courtroom. And it would achieve three goals, potentially. The, the pilot is, is designed to test three, probably more, but three basic goals. One, preventing those bills from ever becoming debt uh, that weighs down the household and you know has a long list of other negative effects, both for health and, and their household economics. Two, to clear up the judge's docket. And then three, just test and see whether or not um, using an ODR would actually help hospitals uh, recoup some of, of the, the, the money. So um, we're, we're excited to see where it goes. There's a lot of interest um, that wouldn't be just for medical debt, but for other types of debt too. Um, but clearly keeping households and individuals out of the courtroom when they don't need to be there um, would be an important uh, and, and highly impactful outcome. Mm -hmm. I'll ask um, the mayor and Jerry, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a take on, on debt collections? Um, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking like right now, a lot of places the courts are turned off, like right in this moment, right? And, but lawsuits are still stacking up. Um, and I just wonder, do we have reason to be concerned when things sort of turn back on? Will we see fair outcomes? Any thoughts from either of you? Uh, I, I, and I'll let Jerry speak more specifically because he probably has the expertise. There's my doorbell. Um, but um, as, as we're all working from home, that's going to also mean a dog's going to bark. Um, but uh, I, I'll say, you know, unfortunately, uh, there's no aspect of our experience that would make us uh, assume that we're going to see equitable outcomes as things turn back on. Uh, part of my focus has been on the public sector side of it. You know, so many of those families who own you know, a housing debt that's backed by the federal government, so many of those families that own uh, student debt that's backed by the federal government, uh, so many families that own like that municipal debt that I was talking about, uh, those are things that are directly within our realm as community, you know, as, as, as a, in, in the public sector. And, you know, we could choose to let that be a pile on, or we could choose to let that be a relief valve. Uh, and it's gonna require some, some uh, prioritization uh, it's going to require some focus and it's going to require certainly some accounting flexibility, creativity, uh, but that's within our realm to do. Uh, and that's something that I think is really important that we do to create the type of relief valve uh, that our American public is absolutely going to need for us as we, from us as we move forward. Yeah, so... Karen, as, you, as you've mentioned, we, you know, having done some work with Aspen around collections and, and, and as Laura mentioned as well, you know, the court system has historically been, you know, weaponized uh, against consumers who are, you know, feeling the, the pinch uh, during financial distress. Um, you know, we see about $40 billion goes through bankruptcy uh, last year, $40 billion went through Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Uh, and then there's innumerable amount of, of, of court cases that are filed every year to garnish wages um, and so forth. Uh, we believe, uh, for us, I, I think the, the key is, again, it goes back to realizing that consumers who have historically made their payments, um, who experienced a financial shock, didn't all of a sudden decide to fraud, you know, to, to do some fraudulent activity or defraud the bank or the creditors, right? So. What we hope is that many of the creditors, uh, the uh, big banks and so forth, would, would adopt some of the same approaches that you know, mayor, the mayor has, has discussed, which is acknowledging the, the situation. I mean, 
it would be impossible. And 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 we hope COVID is is, is sort of that you know turning point in the way that you know uh, creditors acknowledge the the realities of of our American households and that their their you know financial insecurities and fragility um, because. With 38.6 million consumers out of out of you know, or unemployed in some capacity, that's a massive shock to the system. And the only way we can re, you know we can rebuild the system is for everyone to take um, a, a, an approach that is different and that that's holistic and and, and that's innovative um, to be able to really rebuild it stronger. Yeah, Jerry, I would jump on top of that with. You know, what we were talking about before, where I think this moment is really allowing people to see the the connectivity among these various issues, right? So at Sycamore, we we look at health and economic prosperity in terms of four buckets. One, financial security, where this obviously sits. Two, like a sense of satisfaction or a sense of purpose, a meaningful life. Three, connectivity to you know family, friends, our community, our jobs. And then lastly, our physical and mental health, right? We get sick, we need medical care, we get medical bills. If we can't afford those bills, it puts off paying for other things that we need. And, and I, I see that there's a greater understanding that all of these um, buckets of, of wants and needs are, are connected. And I'm hopeful that that will stick as we move through this crisis and, and beyond it and probably on to the next one. So I'll ask a, ask a two-part question. I'd love to get your thoughts on all of on I'd love to get all of your thoughts on both parts. Uh, so part one is what is what is the thing that has you the most worried? Like what are the thing what what's when you are lying there at 3 a.m. and can't sleep thinking about, you know, Mayor, your residence, or Laura, what you're seeing in the data, or Jerry, your end customer, um, what are you most worried about for people? And then the flip side, right? Which is um, what uh, what kind of leadership are you seeing right now that gives you hope that this will be a turning point, structurally speaking? Because what I hear you saying is now is a moment to recognize the structural problems that have led to this these debt burdens for families. So that's just like a huge question. Who wants to go first? I'm happy to jump in. We're seeing two crises right now. We're seeing a public health crisis and we're seeing an economic crisis. We've sort of suspended reality with both, with the sort of uh, stay at home orders that we're seeing around the country, the shelter in place orders, and with the you know orders to you know suspend or pause evictions and foreclosures and you know all of these kind of drastic uh, but temporary measures that were taken around the country. The biggest, I think that thing that keeps me up at night is what happens when we go back to reality. Are we just going to go back to an unchanged reality? What happens when we, you know, when we uh, lift, start lifting these stay in, stay in place orders, uh, you know, and people start moving about, uh, we fully expect to see cases, uh, cases spike again. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with that. And hopefully we can do that in a way that keeps our hospitals from being overrun. Uh, the same is true. What happens when we say, okay, you can start evicting people again now. Okay, you can start foreclosing again now. Uh, and how do we uh, address the economic fallout that's going to come from this? And frankly, the two are related because as folks get displaced, as folks get desperate, uh, then that's going to make folks more and more vulnerable uh, to public health crises like this pandemic. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, as I watch the, the the vacuum of leadership right now, as it feels from the Senate, and the vacuum of leadership as it feels uh, from the White House, uh, and that's the best euphemism that I can uh, muster right now. Um, I'm also um, uh, equally in, um, um, uh, enthused and inspired uh, by my colleague mayors around the country, who frankly were copycatting on a number of things. One of the first things that we did was uh, was suspend water shutoffs so every family can afford to wash their hands. I copied Atlanta Mayor uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms on that. I talked about our bridge fund, which is essentially a form of emergency universal basic income. I'm copying mayors like Michael Tubbs in Stockton, California, and Chokwe Lumumba, uh, Chokwe Lumumba in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, who have uh, pioneered UBI experiments kind of in their local communities. Uh, we're working to uh, communicate well to, to residents and make sure that people understand what's going on, understand why the uh, orders and the public health guidance we're getting is so critical. Uh, we're taking a lot of pages, for example, from Mayor, uh, Mayor Randall Woodfin in Birmingham. So, you know, I'm, I'm really inspired by the energy, the creativity, uh, and the, the commitment 
of leadership that's happening at the local level and particularly for mayors around the country right now? Yeah, I think these things are, my, my answer is two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I worry about? I worry about seeing reports that hospitals are starting to sue their patients for bills that they can't afford. Um, again, I worry about how we're seeing more um, clearly how mm -hmm. debt is holding families and communities and states even underwater. We're seeing how it affects different groups of people in different ways, whether it's race or sex or socioeconomic status. Um, and, and, and we know that they, there are known effective solutions to dealing with some of these problems, um, but it, it's dark, right? There's a lot of, of, of darkness and a lot of fear generating uh, decisions and, and leadership that, that you know, causes us, I think, all worry. Um, but I think the, the good side of this, you know, I, I love my job and I love what I do and I love the people that I get to do it with. Um, but they come across from across the political perspective uh, spectrum. But what they agree on is that we want to talk about the facts and the data. And sometimes those conversations are hard, um, but we need to have more honest conversations about what we're seeing in the data, about what is happening to people and households and communities that, that are struggling with debt. Um, and I think the politics of it and the public policy can be messy and slow and frustrating, um, but I also see hope that, that we'll see better policymaking come out of this because we're having more honest, rigorous, uh, and frankly, apolitical conversations uh, about what the solutions are. So that's my hope. That's life-giving, Laura. I like it. <laughs> Jerry, what are your thoughts? Oh, man, so much, so many thoughts. Um, I, I think I'll echo, you know, Mayor, uh, Carter and 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 his thoughts around the decimation of 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 you know the economic fallout that will happen um, once you know some of the uh, measures that have been taken to keep you know households in in their home and to minimize um, the the cost to them in time of financial distress. What what happens when when all of those measures are, are you know safety blankets are now removed? Um, I, you know, the decimation of the small business uh, class, I think, will have you know will reverberate throughout our system. Um, the you know likely fall you know the impact to our our, our you know uh, supply chain, whether that's food or or you know all other things. So, what will that mean for you know households as as, as you know f you know we see an in increase in in food costs, right? Um, and 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 then more importantly, I think what what does it mean for for America as as the the digital shift starts to you know it is is accelerated um, you know as as we have more folks going to work uh, remotely, um, what does that mean for our urban centers? Uh, what does that mean for our rural areas? Um, how does that impact uh, you know the financial security of households across America? What does that mean for jobs in America? Um, and, 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 and so, you know, I think there, there's, right now we're, we're, we're obviously dealing with the symptoms um, and, and we have historically dealt with the symptoms. Uh, and I think it's, it's even more important now and, and this time to start thinking about the secondary and tertiary um, impacts that, you know, both this economic and, and, and health um, pandemic um, will have on, on, on America going forward. Um, um, oh, go ahead, Laura. Same. What do you all see, I mean, particularly you, Mayor Carter, as some of the positive driving forces for getting people to look long term, right? It's easy in a crisis to look at the short term. What do we do now? What, what do we do with this, our sense of urgency? Um, but I think the challenge for real long term change means looking upstream and looking long term. I'm just curious what that looks like for you. Uh, that that's a good question because particularly right now, I mean, the, the the things at the tip of our nose, the challenge underfoot is so great that sometimes it's hard to even think about next week as opposed to next year. You know, piggybacking on what Jerry just said, you know, I mean, the the, the concerns about the way real estate is set up, the concerns about the way our employment. You know, my grandfather grew up in a community in which the like. Uh, the, the, the kind of public agreement was in order to just create all the, all the goods that we needed to consume. We had to have somebody who had a job delivering ice and somebody who had a job at the local store and some, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that's been dissipating with automation and a, a number of other forces. Um, but this is, this feels like a cliff uh, as a number of employees are, are, are laid off who aren't going to be brought back on when this is like over, right? 
Uh, by the way, this is not going to be like over anytime soon in the sense that we're just going to, you know, snap back to something. Um, and so, you know, to, to me, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of kind of advocates at the local level who are making the argument, like I said earlier, that some of the things, that some of the temporary measures that we're taking uh, ought to be just the way that we live. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're all kind of adjusting who our, our, our Twitter, who, who we follow on Twitter as we see the kind of public health professionals, the economic experts, uh, people like you, frankly, who, you know, have this national platform to say, you know, we need to realign the way we think about medical debt or the way we think about housing debt or the way we think about, you know, government, you know, fines and fees and the way that we're talking about right now. Uh, incidentally, a lot of that work, I copy uh, city treasurer Tashara Jones in uh, St. Louis. Uh, and so we're, 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 we're copying people very, uh, very liberally here. I, I, mayors always say good mayors borrow, great mayors steal. Uh, and uh, I, I prove myself as a great mayor over and over and over again throughout the course of the year. Um, and so, you know, frankly, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the, the inspiration that I'm getting is coming on a real grassroots level uh, from folks, you know, either on social media or right here in St. Paul uh, at the, you know, who, who are kind of literally at the grassroots making the arguments uh, that we have to be thinking fundamentally differently about the way that we build our future. Like I said before, I don't think we need an economic recovery. I think we need a complete rebuild, a complete reconstruction of the way that we see uh, people interacting with our economy. Right now it's proven more than maybe any point in American history, uh, what many people have argued. While over the last two months, uh, three months, 40% of low income workers have lost their job, the stock market is rallying. The people who have wealth, uh, people who have equity, uh, people who you know are, 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 are playing investments on the stock market, are making uh, interest rates uh, that, uh, that that they're excited about, that are, that, and, and that just serves to further prove uh, that that serves to further prove this divorce between uh, sort of the economy, as we call, as we think of it as a whole, and the economic reality that people are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why I said what I said at the beginning that it's the same to me. You know, when, when when the stock market is rallying, but I can't figure out how to pay the rent, that's the same force for me as when the, the, the folks who we see ourselves hiring in the public sector to protect us uh, when, they, when we see them literally kneeling on our neck. Uh, I think that's why there's so much anger right now. Uh, but out of that anger, I see breeding uh, a, a new level of focus, a new level of dedication, uh, and a new level of resolve to say, we're going to rebuild this better than it was in the first place. Right. Are, are we, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Jerry. I had a no, no, go ahead. I, the mayor dropped a lot of uh, a lot of heavy and, and and critical nuggets, so I was just processing some of it. Sorry, well, go I ahead. I was going to ask a question that forces you to process <laughs> it. So, and we got a similar question just in from our Q and A, but I, I was sitting here thinking, you know, um, Megan, can you put up that the second slide again, um, the one that shows the debt composition? Um, it's hard not to look at debt in America and realize that this isn't just a cash flow problem for people, right? It is. These are expenses that are overwhelming American households, and they're in they're, they're in the red. Um, these are also the way, in large part, the way that we've chosen as a society to finance public good, right? Some um, credit card. If you if if you assume the credit card is some mix of, you know personal choice and spending, but also bridging gaps in paycheck to paycheck living, right? Um, student loans, auto loans, et cetera. We've met, we, we have an economic structure um, and medical debt is not even here, right? Because it's an unpaid bill as opposed to, as opposed to secured or unsecured lending. And so when you think about, this is perhaps a set of choices that we've made around financing um, aspects of, of, of life um, and the combination like the mayor started to talk about about the lack of assets right i mean this is an it's an issue also because people don't have assets they don't have equity are we ready to take this on as a society is this is now is now the moment could now be the moment when we sort of step back and say does this does this system really work for households you know i'll, I'll kind of go big and broad for a second um and say i think you know, one of the things i hope comes out of this is people's understanding of these issues, you know, debt, household debt, you know, a lot of issues 
that it's not just about the individual or a household level, but about all these other layers that fold around that individual household. So, you know, the, the community, the organizational and institutional and, and broader community that these problems, that, that this is not just a, a problem for a single individual or a household, but, but for all of us, we, we share this burden. And I, I'm hoping that that will be something that, that people come out of this pandemic uh, with a better understanding of the interconnectivity of it all. But Laura, how do I make that connection when we've had the best quarter in, in stock market history? I, I mean, how, how do I, how do I, you know, how do I feel the connectivity if I'm a, a you know, as an investor, as an asset holder, as a owner, you know, of 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 stocks and and, and with a 401k and with, uh, you know. Uh, trust funds and things like that. How do we make that connectivity? Because for me, the economy is back. We're roaring, right? You know, for me, I'm uh, not necessarily me personally, but, <laughs> but let, you know, ha, ha, so, so, you know, there, you know, the mayor said there's this divorce between reality, you know, people's reality and economic reality. And, and as long as we, we still hold the stock market as the benchmark for economic prosperity, Right. Then how do I truly reconcile the idea that which you're saying, which is this interconnectivity of of of, of systems um, in that when America catches a cold, black America catches a flu, as the mayor you know, alluded to in his um, comments earlier. I, so how do we how do we find that connective tissue? No, I mean, my team makes fun of me because I say two things all the time about our work. Like one, it's more complicated than that. Usually the way we're discussing these issues that they've been simplified down so much that we've lost the deeper meaning and lost an ability to hold on to or to grapple with some of the solutions because they, they can be messy. And then two, it's, you know, yes and, right? So yes, your stock portfolio may be doing better, but you also need to pick up your local paper and find out what's going on in your community. What's going on with your mayor's office and the decision, your city council, your state legislature, what are the policies that are being put in place or not put in place sometimes um, that are affecting the people in your neighborhood, the people you know, and, and people who are, are, you know, in all the various communities that you're in. Um, and it's hard, but it's, you know, it's a yes and. We, we have to stop thinking in either or, but in yes and terms. Yeah, yes, Laura. And um, <laughs> I would say, you know, Jerry, to your point, you know, two things. One, uh, if your economy has already bounced back, I'd love to borrow 20 bucks. I'll call you about that after this thing, <laughs> after the call is over. Uh, but two, it's a paper economy. What we have online, what we have in the stock market is literally a paper economy. Uh, it's, 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 it's paper assets that people are trading. And those assets are only good as long as they're backed by something. And the something that our assets have always been backed by in America has been the, the, the resolve, the health, uh, the commitment of the American workforce. Uh, and the, the, the American workforce uh, is right now unemployed. The American workforce is struggling to feed their children. The American workforce don't know how they're gonna pay the rent next month. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully, Jerry, if you're one of those kind of asset holding class uh, who's feeling like these stocks are going, uh, hopefully you're farsighted enough to realize that this isn't sustainable uh, in, in, in the current format. Uh, and we can make some big moves right now. Uh, if you're not uh, forward thinking enough to realize that now, uh, well, then there's a cliff coming uh, because you know, none of this is sustainable. Like I said, it feels like a paper economy right now uh, that just won't hold up unless we figure out a new way to invest in our workforce and invest in just families and our communities. You know, I, I think, and, and Mayor, I, I completely agree with you, uh, you know, but even prior to COVID, right, you had leaders like Ray Dalio, uh, Jamie Dimon, um, Paul Tudor Jones, who have been in Warren Buffett and, you know, the leaders of, you know, the asset holders who have yep. been, who've been ringing the alarm bell and, and saying that we are, you know, the, the economy is, is the inequities in the economy are just too large to be sustainable. Yet, and <laughs> um, we had not taken any steps or uh, to, to rectify that. 
knowing that it's a you know it's a major risk. Now COVID um, has obviously accelerated some of that thinking and and or even again made it more abundantly clear that this inequity um, is not sustainable and, and quite frankly is dangerous to our economy. And unfortunately, COVID has also accelerated the utilization of, of technology and, and the adoption of, of technology and work from home. And, and that will have repercussions uh, and, and, and possibly could possibly further erode um, you know, household income and, and, or further uh, accelerate income inequality in this country. So as leaders, um, as a you know, government leader mayor, how do you think about the potential impact, right? That the you know, digitization of, of the corporate structure uh, will have in, on 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 cities like your like you know St. Paul. Um, I think uh, uh, Warren Zeri, you're supposed to send me these questions in advance. <laughs> you didn't prep me for the question. Um, but two, I think it's uh, multifold. Uh, my, I've got a two-month-old uh, chief of staff. Uh, th this this is the one that keeps her up at night, uh, clearly as you can hear. I think it's multifold. We've seen Twitter, for example, already say they're not going back to work. Uh, they have shifted to a remote workforce uh, and they're gonna allow people to work from home uh, indefinitely. Uh, as companies make that decision, uh, then you know that uh, could potentially pull the rug out from our uh, commercial real estate uh, economy, right? Uh, the other thing it'll do is uh, it'll help to exacerbate the digital, digital divides. Uh, for some of us, uh, 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 a high a high fidelity, uh, high definition internet connection uh, is like oxygen that we breathe, or is like water. Uh, of course, we'll have one everywhere we go. And for other families, uh, there's just not that same level of comfort. There's not that same level of accessibility to the internet. Uh, and so, you know, th those families uh, could 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 face potentially being locked out of the workforce. Ultimately, I'll tell you, uh, it, it, it see, there seems to be no way around just a uh, immense uh, federal uh, stimulus uh, that uh, boosts families, that, uh, that, that uh, at least explores universal basic income, uh, that, changes the way, uh, the, that changes the way families um, uh, participate in our economy. Our families, our public, our communities, uh, our residents ought to be like shareholders in the American economy. And if you're a shareholder, if you're a stakeholder, if you're an owner and an investor, you started the question, Karen, asking me about equity. And our definition of equity is simple. I, went, I, got a, I have a master's degree in public policy and in policy school, it sometimes gets hard to define equity. My bachelor's degree is in business administration, and it's really clear what equity means in the corporate world. It's about decision-making power, it's about shares of ownership, and it's about the ability to gain uh, transferable wealth that I can transfer to my children. And so that if, if, if we're gonna be an equitable country, we have to make sure that every family knows that they are owners uh, of this country, that they're shareholder owners, that they're part of the decision-making processes of how this country moves forward, and that when our economy grows, uh, it might be a little bit easier for them to pay the rent. That's gonna require a significant federal commitment of policy, of energy, of money, uh, and I don't think we're gonna be out of the woods on this until we find our appetite to do just that. So I'm, I'm watching questions come in and your answer, you guys are answering them in real time. So I haven't even been able to ask them, but one, um, one bucket was basically about metrics, right? Which is, uh, have we been looking in the wrong direction, um, i.e. stock market or an unemployment rate that doesn't necessarily tell the full story of work in America um, to gauge whether or not our economy is working. There's one sort of bucket of questions there. And then I think, I think I'll just ask a final question of each of you, and Mayor, you can decide if you already just, you may have just given your answer to it, but you know, big picture, we've got too many people in this country who, who don't own, they owe, and you've got a minority of people who do own, right? They have equity, they're participating in the growth, and for them, debt is how you leverage up. But for the majority of Americans, that's not true, right? Debt is the, debt is the stone that drags you down and you don't participate in growth. How do we change that? Like, what is the work we need to do now to begin to build a society where more people own than owe? I'll start. Um, I think an honest and rigorous and accurate understanding of the data that we have 
is a really good place to start. I know at least in Tennessee, a lot of our work is driven by seeing a place where there's not enough data or not enough information or there's a lot of misunderstanding. So we wanna talk about poverty mitigation in Tennessee. Well, let's talk about the fact that a quarter of Tennesseans have medical debt that is weighing them down, as you said. So really, I think it has to start with a, an honest, rigorous and accurate understanding of what the data and evidence tell us about what the problems are and what the possible solutions are. Gary, any thoughts? Yeah, and um, follow up with, to Laura's point, I think it's a willingness to also have the tough conversations and to do the tough work um, and to not just try to, to solve for the surface level, right? Um, again, we've known that nearly half of Americans can't come up with $400 <laughs> to deal with a financial shock. We've known that, again, this is all prior to COVID, right? We've known that income inequality has led to massive um, debt, you know, household debt, because we are subsidizing income with debt. Um, we've known that uh, the inequities within, you know, the American financial system is well known, right? Um, minority people of color uh, are significantly um, have significantly less wealth, or no no wealth, <laughs> we should say, you know, relative to 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 their counterparts, uh, to their white counterparts, you know, as 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 women, right? So we know these inequities. The data has shown that. So I, you know, Laura, I challenge the fact that I challenge the data piece because the data isn't what has not been available. I truly believe what has not been is, is the courage and the commitment to tackle and have these difficult, both have these difficult conversations and to tackle these issues head on. And it takes, it'll take, um, you know, a, a holistic approach and, and all stakeholders, government, um, business, and, 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 and us consumers, you know, uh, to, 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 to come together and to think about what, what is the path forward. And I do think COVID, actually present us with a perfect opportunity um, to, 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 to you know, have these discussions, have these conversations and, and clear, the, clear the slate. So that's a good clarification though. Um, I mean, I think in some places the data aren't available. Um, mm -hmm. When we look to disaggregate some data sets by race and ethnicity, for example, uh, some of the data is not collected that way. So in some sense yeah. that's not available. But yeah, I should clarify. I should say that the data is not being used in decision making, yeah. right? And it needs to be brought into leadership. And it does take courage uh, to look. I mean, you know, I do presentations all the time about the status of things in Tennessee. And I can go back on some of the, you know, let's take health metrics. And I can go back 30 years and I show disastrous health metrics when you aggregate by different groups of people. And nothing has changed really. What we've been doing and what we're currently doing is not really addressing uh, these kinds of issues, whether it's mitigating debt or improving health outcomes. Um, so I, I, yes, I think it's that the data has to be brought up and used in, in leadership and decision making um, where it is available. Yeah, but thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's, I, I would just piggyback on all of those things that, you know, to me, uh, the economic inequality or the, the, the vast and growing gap between the haves and have nots, uh, the, the owners and the owners, as you put it, uh, to me, that economic inequality is the single greatest threat uh, to our American national security. That might have been a bold claim three months ago, but in the COVID reality, we've proven that. Uh, I have given probably most of my answer, but three quick things. I think we need to do a better job teaching people about money and how to make their money work for them. We have people in our community whose money is working against and people who are money is working for. Uh, and if you wanted to boost every uh, outcome in a community, you know, one of the things you could do is, 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 is endeavor to raise uh, average credit scores, for example, by 50 to 100 points in our lowest income communities uh, so that people aren't stuck, you know, going to same day lenders. Because as we talk about, you know, the, the, the debt, you know, uh, uh, Jerry, you were talking about supplementing income with debt. You know, the thing that I know that you're aware of that you didn't, that, 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 that compounds that is that we're not even talking about with, with good debt or secured debt or low interest debt. We're talking about sometimes 300 and 400 percent interest debt through those same day lenders. So teaching people how to make their money work for them, I think, is really critical. I think bringing uh, our, our, our financial supports 
uh, into the 21st century is absolutely critical. If I want to change my insurance or sell a stock, I can do it right on my smartphone. Uh, but if I need WIC or child care support or something like that, I'm suddenly looking for a fax machine. We're not going to get into the future in that way. Uh, and then the final thing is telling the story and bringing these individual struggles to, to, to a public policy level to make sure that families know we have so much shame around the conversations about finances, about around poverty, around debt. It's so laced with shame and it's intentional because we've created this kind of virtual, virtue signaling language that says, if you can't afford to pay your mortgage or your rent, then you're a bad person. And we have to, especially right now, especially in the coming year, we're going to have to lift that to a public policy level to make sure that people understand, no, 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 you're, you, you didn't jump off of a boat. This whole thing is sinking and we need policy level. We need, you know, a, a policy level solutions to help you and the millions of other families who are in your exact same situation right now. I, there's nothing I would rather do more today than continue talking with all of you and getting your perspectives. Um, I just want to thank um, all of you so much for taking the time. Um, the conversation that we've just had will be made available online soon. Um, and I just want to flag that uh, we'd encourage all of you to join us next week uh, on Wednesday, June 3rd at the same time, 1 o'clock Eastern, um, when we'll be discussing paid leave and dependent care, um, which is also reared its head as um, a pain point for American households. Um, so please um, go off, have a great day. Mayor, we're thinking of you and the Twin Cities community. Um, and thanks for doing your great work. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura and Jerry. Thank you. Bye-bye.